Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Barbara. I'm, I'm an evolutionary astrologer. And I'm also training um, with the Stangraft Transpersonal Training and um, Holotropic Breathwork. And I'm just beginning to also do some um, psychedelic research uh, in the exploration of consciousness. And um, I think my next step is going to be to use astrology as I am beginning to observe that it can be such a good tool to, um, as a diagnostic tool and also as a um, integration tool for after this um, journeys. So that's kind of what I do. Um, and um, the reason I picked the moon is because I have such a good relationship with the moon. I'm, my moon is in Cancer, it's clearing the nodes. So according to EA, that is a skip step. And um, yeah, it's just been such a, such a close uh, celestial body in my life. I follow it in the sky and um, very close to it. So I decided to, why not do a, um, a presentation on the moon. So I'm gonna start with the first slide. And I picked, um, I picked the title, The Moon and the Formation of the Skin Encapsulated Ego. And I use this term, it's not by me, it's actually uh, coined by Alan Watts. He was a uh, British philosopher and writer. And um, he's the one that coined this term. And I find it very, um, um, very telling of what the moon represents and what we're going to be talking about here. So um, when he talks about this, he, um, he actually mentions what he means by the skin encapsulated ego is um, how when we come become babies when we incarnate. We kind of have this um, boundless relationship to, to everything, to the environment, to our mothers, to objects. And um, it's kind of this participation mystique that we're in, where we're kind of in an, in an oceanic sort of thing with everything. And it is little by little as we se separate, differentiate, that we begin to form this uh, capsule and uh, form this ego, the self-image. And um, I think the skin that encapsulates would be actually Saturn, but the content would be the moon. And, um, and why the moon? Because when we come into, into being, when we incarnate, we're emotional beings. We are instinctual, emotional beings, kind of everything is dominated by the limbic brain. We're not intellectual beings. We don't have language. Um, we don't have um, ideation and the way to formulate thoughts. It, it, everything happens through this kind of felt perception field and, and the feelings. And that's what the moon is. It's like we come in and the moon is like that first encounter with, with our life on earth. And, uh, and the image here, what he says, um, I think I'll just read it. Uh, skin encapsulated ego is, in effect, the, prover the proverbial cuckoo, coconut shell beneath which the frog resides, as in the popular Malay saying, katakti bawa tempuru. Unless the creature emerges from under the protective cover of the coconut shell, <clears throat> it can begin to explore and experience increasingly greater realities. However, the skin encapsulated ego is vital to the process of, of individuation, without which nothing would be unique and there would be hardly any distinct texture to reality itself. So what does that mean and why did I pick that? Well, because <clears throat> I find that it is the moon and how we start to perceive everything and we form our self-image. This is how we come to being. And, um, and in a way, it begins to limit us. At some point, we gotta break free from that to, to evolve. And this is where um, EA and evolution comes into place, that we gotta really work through our moon um, to break out of this coconut shell, to break out of it and access the rest of who we are. But without it, 
we wouldn't be able to function. We wouldn't be able to really feel this reality and be here. I think, um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. Do I change that or do you change yes. that? Yes. Bottom left hand corner, click on the screen. There it is, the arrow. Oh, yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. okay, good. So the next one is the moon and, um, and the womb. So, um, and this is by Patricia Walsh. You probably know her and her um, book, Karmic Complexes. And uh, I took this because I thought it was extremely representative. And she says that in the womb, the consciousness is downloading all the previous experiences of humanity along with the karmic conditions. And it forms a template of the shell that will grow and harden after birth and through childhood. So the moon, so as we come in, in my observation, in my experience, as we come in from the, uh, from, from the unconscious, from the cosmic consciousness, we come as a soul with our soul memories that include our karmic past. This is why the moon is also the past. Actually in shamanic and the mystery school of shamanic astrology, the moon is also your lineage. Um, if you think about it, when you are in the womb, um, I think it is that you are in your mother's ovary in your grandmother's womb. So if you can get a, a picture of that, a sense of that, you can get a sense of the lineage that you've been with your mother, with your grandmother, and there is a sort of thread of emotions, of things that are of imprints that are coming with them and with you, that you're carrying in your lineage. So as we come in into the, our, our mother's womb, the physical womb, we begin to get imprinted, even from the moment of conception. And it's been proven by now that whatever happens to our mother, um, three seconds later, the fetus experiences it. So this begins to imprint our consciousness and the organism. And this is where, what is called the perinatal experiences that are part of the, of the moon. And um, so our self-image begins to form even then. We may not be com conscious of it. We don't have language, we don't have words, but it's beginning to happen. And then we come down. Let me see, let me just check my notes. Mm -mm -mm -mm. What I want to say, moon has passed. Yeah. So, so we begin to form this self image very, very, very early on. We get imprints. This is why it is very hard to get past the mother. And this is something that Sigmund Freud said. Uh, the mother is the hardest thing to overcome. And I guess it is because the imprints of the moon are so deeply unconscious, are so deeply rooted, so ingrained in the deepest of our being. And, um, and it comes from the experience of our mother. In the womb, we're not differentiated. We cannot tell ourselves apart from her. Even when we actually are born, um, it takes a while for, for the baby, for the child to begin to differentiate. So all of that becomes part of our, of our moon complexes and our moon and our self image. We begin to form it like that. So, and the imprintings that we can find in the moon can be karmic, meaning we bring it. Sometimes we pick, and this is why sometimes we pick a certain moon, a chart, uh, where we get imprinted once again by our mothers, by our early childhood development, by our environments, re-imprinted in whatever we were trying to resolve and we kind of left them finished. So we kind of re-imprint it again so the psyche can work on it and hopefully try to resolve it. And we find that a lot of times is, is a lot harder than set them down, that we tend to kind of trip over um, this very deep emotional imprints that we have with the moon. So um, I think the next slide will be moon as internalized mother. So we tend to um, internalize our mother, meaning we have such a close relationship for such a long time with her. 
and it takes a while to differentiate that even when we do we continue to um make some of those things our own even in a very unconscious deep way that we may not realize and uh, it may take a lot of self-exploration to finally come to terms and see oh wow that that is actually a pattern that and, and sometimes it comes as a reaction that we we send something uh, about our mothers or we try to uh, rebel a lot against them and um they really become really confrontational with our mothers. And a lot of that sometimes is how we are trying to resolve all of that that we internalized about our mothers. And instead of resolving it within us, we're kind of projecting it. We're kind of like seeing it in them and in, in our mothers and getting really um, bad heads. And this tends to happen a lot in um, the teenage years. But it can continue to happen. It can continue to happen as we grow older. And I don't know if you ever heard um, people say that as you grow older, you can resemble your mother. And uh, I find that to be true sometimes. I can go and look at my mother and go, oh my God, I kind of do that. I didn't even know. And um, yeah, our mothers can be great, great mirrors to us. They can really show. If, if we look, if we pay attention, they can really present and show us those uh, those ways in which we internalize them. And we were talking about lineage and how we carry that lineage. So we carry that. We carry that from them, from our grandmothers. And um, I think our purpose here is to continue to carry that lineage, to honor it, to hold a place in our hearts for them because we come from them. We chose them for a reason. But to actually break out of that coconut shell and explore who we can be, who can, how can we actually differentiate in a way that we can still honor them, but become more and more unique and more of our own selves. And that I think is the trickiest moon work that we can do is, is, is the hardest, is, is very, um, yeah, I don't think that, um, I think that talk therapy can only go so far when it comes to this because of um, how deeply rooted these imprints are, uh, deeply in the unconscious, and uh, especially they were imprinted in a moment when we were not language-oriented. So there are other mod modalities that definitely work for this. And um, uh, past life regression is one of them, um, non-ordinary states of consciousness, journeying, those can be amazing ways of accessing and actually relieving all of these moments um, in super powerful ways so we can begin to actually make peace and expand and create a new self-image that like I said before that encompasses the lineage but that moves forward moves ahead in evolution let's see the next one I picked is um, Soma, Soma and the moon. So Soma was, um, was the moon, one of the moon deities associated, um, associated with the moon in Hindu tradition. And uh, in Hindu tradition, the moon is actually masculine. And, um, and Soma was also a drink. It is actually recorded in the Rig Veda, the ancient, the ancient texts that um, apparently they participated in this sort of ritual where they drunk um, something that they call Soma. I bought in itself today are research in the subject and they believe that it was probably made out of some sort of psychedelic mushrooms. But they did this and they, um, and they participated in these rituals to um, expand consciousness, to explore consciousness. So it's very interesting that Soma and the moon are kind of sharing the same name um, here in the story. The Hindu deity is um, traveling, um, flying, I think it says, uh, on by horses. And he's, so I was also the elixir that the gods would drink. And as they were drinking, the moon would um, wane and then it would wax. 
So, um, yeah, and why I brought up Soma was because it feels to me in my own experience and in the uh, observations of others that um, have gone through this um, type of um, non-ordinary states of consciousness, be it through ingesting something or just through uh, breath work and holotropic um, sceneries, that before we can truly access the transpersonal realms and really have that full expression of unity, we can have to clear up the bushes. And the clearing up the bushes has to do with this whole emotional um, imprinting, early childhood, that actually relates to, you know, karmic, uh, re-imprinting of the karmic pattern. And it feels like the trajectory is never linear, but it feels like there is a lot of this clearing of the bushes before we can actually go and pop out fully. And um, this is something that I just um, observed with myself and my explorations and, and with others and, um, and how powerful it can be to re-experience this moment. Uh, the moon being associated with the womb, with, um, with women's cycles, it's definitely uh, associated with birth. It's one of the water triads. So the theme of birth is very important. And being born is a very, very intense experience. Um, to the point that it leaves, it leaves some imprints in us, very different types of imprints. Uh, Stan Groff was the one that um, mapped this, uh, the psyche, he called the, the cartography of, of the psyche through the exploration of a lot of patients and a lot of people that he sat for, um, I think it was since the 50s and through the 80s. And then he uh, called this, perinatal matrixes, and he distinguished four of them that we all go through as we are being born. And, um, and every, every one of them is associated with a planet. And um, yeah, and the moon is not associated with any particular matrix, but it kind of permeates them all. The moon as our overall mood filter of day-to-day -day consciousness. So we all have moods, you know, good mood, bad mood. Uh, we're happy about something, something good happens to us, something bad happens to us, we get unhappy. That's kind of like a reality. But then what I mean by the moon being like our overall mood is more like a compass. It's more like this kind of default mood that we have constantly whether you know we can be pessimistic mostly optimistic extroverted introverted sensitive psychologically oriented we have certain orientations and that can be found in the moon as well and the moon as a dream catcher uh someone brought this up to my attention once and uh i started to to see if it was true. So, and it was pretty interesting actually what happened. As you can trace the moon um, through your chart, you can kind of keep a journal and um, by your dreams and then see where the moon was transiting during that time, whether it was your first house, your second house, uh, what, what sign occupies that house, what planets were there. And then you can kind of see that theme uh, in what emerges in the dream world. It's pretty interesting to watch. So if you are interested in dream work, I am very interested, this may be a good exercise. Um, and the more, the more you do it, the more you work with it this way, the more vivid and lucid uh, your dreams become. And I think I am... Um, Good with that. Um, any questions so far? OK. 
Can you hear me, Linda? Yes. So, um, yeah. So I'm ready to, to maybe do some work with the volunteers if you are. Okay, so the volunteers are here. If you could, would you like to go to their charts? Yes, please. Okay. Hi, Camilla. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. So, do you have any questions or do you want me to, how do you want to do that? Do you have any particular questions that you wanted to ask? Um, I, I don't think so. I just want to comment that it's been a real challenge to have those two, Pluto and the Moon, in a, in a opposition. And I've been pondering a lot about, especially after I, I got involved with evolutionary astrology, um, the concept between, of course, we know what Pluto is and then the Moon and them being in opposition to each other and widely squaring the nodes. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, it, it's basically, it, it, the moon is not really at the polarity point, but it's very close. Yeah. So um, every time I try to pull out of the, the Pluto place, um, not that I do it always consciously, I encounter that moon and, mm. and it's a pretty, pretty um, hurt <laughs> moon. Um, so, I mean, the, the good thing is, I guess, that the Chiron is in balsamic phase, and I can tell that I'm feeling it, uh, but um, <clears throat> it nevertheless, it, it's really, it, 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 it doesn't make it easier. Right. This is a very interesting chart. I saw it when I received it, and I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. You got your work cut out for yourself. Yeah, every time, every once in a while, I, I I raise my head and I and I think to myself, what what the hell were you thinking? I mean, it, <laughs> it made it a little easier, but I guess it was time. So I mean, Pluto yeah. is the skip step, <laughs> not the nodes. Right, right. With Pluto square in the nodes, this is um, the soul is really like making a point to really do it this time to stop flip flopping from one to the other, and uh, it's. It's interesting, like you said it, it's going to hurt. I mean, Chiron is right there, right on your moon, on the polarity point. They're not exact, but they're there. I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's 43 and 46. It's, it's pretty much on it. So it's almost like you have to go to the wounding, to the emotional wounding, and clear that out to actually resolve yeah. the polarity right. point. Yeah. You know what I mean? In that Aries moon, together with Chiron there, um, it's a very instinctual moon. Um, it's a moon that, um, you know, with Chiron, it may have made decisions that were very, um, very harsh decision, very, very rushed decisions that may have caused pain, pain to yourself and pain to others. Mm -hmm. And, um, it is in the sixth house. So there is a lot of guilt that comes from that too, from having done that. So in a way you have to, you have to work through those emotions, th through that wounding, through that Chiron really with that moon right there. It's like they're blended together. It's almost like you chose to embody the wounding so you can actually resolve it and come out of it. But yeah i mean and it's not that you gotta get out of your pluto and leave it behind you know this is um it brought you, you you you've developed it for so long you've done it enough and that's where an evolutionary astrology would say we gotta go to the polarity point but we don't leave it behind completely because whatever we learned from that we bring it with us so 
So it's how we bring that and we bring it into the polarity point and integrate it with it. How do we integrate that with that Aries moon that needs a lot of freedom? And in Chiron there is asking the question, do I have the right to exist? Yeah. <laughs> right? Do I have the right to exist? And I kind of feel guilty because this is the us for existing. So how That's exactly how it feels. <laughs> yeah. No, and it, it actually, yeah, feeling guilty for expressing the, the true you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have the, the message that Saturn is in, is in Cancer, and then you have Venus in Capricorn. You kind of like opposing um, archetypes. Mm -hmm. And um, they're both with the nodes. So. Let me bring this together, expressing your truth. And you just said it, you know, in the, your North node is in the, in the third house in Sagittarius, expressing your truth and feeling guilty about it. Yeah, and, and that Saturn is apex of, of a yacht. And so I have I, it, yeah. that was another point that was really difficult and it still is, but I'm getting more conscious about it. Um, of course, to a certain extent, that helps, and and I'm and I'm learning how to work with it more consciously. I don't think that I've been working with it unconsciously, but um, so yeah. I mean, it all ties together. And that is your resolution node. It is the South Node, and whatever yeah. um, whatever happened there with uh, with Gemini on the on the ninth house. Um, let me see where's Mercury. Mercury is there on the second and Scorpio. So yeah, the, um, and Gemini, Gemini in the ninth house can be, um, you know, just very, um, it could have been just very, very, um, a lot of mistakes being done out of just uh, very strong belief systems and, um, and you may come from like a lineage of Eastern traditions too. I think so. With that, yeah. uh, with that South Node in Gemini, you know, Pluto and the, and the 12th. So now it's like, do I have a right to exist? Do I have a right to serve? And how do I serve in a way where I follow my instincts? Yeah. Need for expressing this in a way that is pioneering in a way that is free in a way that is not dependent so much on on the other um clearing all those those because that aries moon can 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 be alone it's it's okay but then that pluto is pulling towards relationship towards relating mm -hmm. towards depending towards considering everything considering the other and the 12 is like what are the boundaries right mm -hmm. so it's a in a way, you picked a really good moon to work through this. Yeah. It's really opposing that, and it's really bringing you that differentiation, that individuality that you need from all of this kind of like uh, all over. It seems like a lot of religious, maybe, um, spiritual life conditioning where the boundaries were kind of like, hmm. It, it, it um, it's based on uh, my work on myself so far. I don't. I don't think it's. It, it's. I think it. It boils down to me uh, hiding who I am for certain um, for for survival, and and I don't think that I I deeply have bought into whatever the the um, official religions were. But I have learned how to survive by following the rules and compromising my own deep, whatever I, I, I think it is, and, and deep beliefs. And so this, of course, is tied into relationships as well. And that's a whole other story. But, um, but I've learned so well to hide, mm. <laughs> to put it in the 12th house, that 
it's difficult for me to pull out of it and to the point where of course because this is pluto and it's a it, it's like a I, I wouldn't black hole is not the right description but it it, it creates like because it attracts things and it's a deeper emotional imprint i get into relationships with people or even in the surroundings that people are against what i do just because of their beliefs which is funny because we live in a 21st century there is plenty of people that are open-minded but because i attract from the point of my um one thing, of course, I end up into those situations and didn't down on me until not so long ago. Um, so I think, I mean, yeah, what you're saying is right. I mean, I just need to pull out of it and, and learn how to s stay within um, what I am. But but the, the problem with that Pluto and that imprint that's been going on for such a long time and Saturn on the, on the south node, is that um, I? I mean, the the habit has created the sense of security, and mm. um, and it's it's very it's it's scary to yeah, yeah. Right. right right that's yeah. the thing about it about the about the moon and the soul it's really really scary to break through that to to leave that sort of security behind even though it may not be helpful for us yeah even though, and the whole finding your truth, speaking your truth, and you've been doing it, like you've been flip-flopping from it yeah. in ways that um, it's like you haven't picked a, picked the right way yet. Mm -hmm. Been doing one, been doing the other. But, um, but yeah, it's about really discernment, discerning and finding yeah exactly who you are and what are you here to serve and to do what's your right to exist and to serve and how to do it mm -hmm. and um and the whole attracting um those who are opposing you are going to be um do they confront you for what you for your beliefs do they mock you or um no it's just i end up in in situations where um like my partner will totally have a totally i mean different belief system and um that's why i'm without for a long period of time so i can figure out what i'm doing and finally i got it um and then or um i will just uh, end up in in a, in a little community or um a city or a place where people would not be open to those things and so because i mean with that those all these libra signatures in this chart i i mean of course in my psyche i compromised myself for you know to be with the partner and i told i mean i i barely started um to realize how much i i don't even register my needs when you're talking about the pre uh, the i'm sorry pre-verbal stage when you're internalizing all the mother complexes and everything that's that's what it was with me and i actually i got to realize it like two years ago i was in the ayahuasca trip so anyway how much um i i don't even get to register my needs i, I don't register them so in order for you to for somebody to say i i like to have this and go for it that's a totally healthy way of me of course not to um uh, harm other people or anything like this but um with me the moment i realized that i want something that i would really enjoy if i have it or be with somebody else um with somebody even a partner that i like i immediately the thought comes that oh no that's not gonna happen so i don't even go there hmm. um yeah so that's what i'm i'm starting to try to notice when it comes because it's been it's been undergoing on, ongoing pattern and i've i haven't even realized it well the you know the resolution no would be in the south node in gemini and the ninth house has to do with embracing diversity uh, of mm. the waves so um you may be attracting that so you can work through that and embrace mm. 
the fact that we can all have different beliefs. We can be together still and be different. Yeah. Okay. And then, we, and then that way you can integrate the right. fact that it's okay that my partner believes in this. Well, I believe in that. We can, we can coexist. We can work together. And uh, for an Aries moon, you saying that you don't even register your needs. That's usually the opposite for Aries moon, but that's because of the Chiron there. Being yeah. It wounded it so much that it's kind of like shutting it down. So the way, mm -hmm. the way through that is going to be through the wound. And yeah. It is going to be through it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just remember that the, the embrace in diversity. And I think okay. that's the switch. Thank you. Thank you. Ardeen? Hi, I'm here. Hi. So any questions, anything you'd like to share first or do you want me to? Go ahead and start. Go ahead and start, okay. Another very interesting chart. Um, huge T-score here uh, with the nodes and the moon, conjunct Pluto and all of that up in, oh, in Virgo. So what is this moon saying to us? So definitely a very, very intense emotional experience. Um, a lot of emotional shock, whether it comes from this lifetime, which I think it probably does, um, definitely from past. So um, yeah, working through this is going to be having to, it's like the moon brings with it, the, the self image brings with it, the soul, um, the soul imprints are all kind of melded together. And um, with the individual and conscious is very, very interesting. Um, in Virgo, um, this is a very self-critical moon. Um, I don't know how, what your mother was like or how you perceived her, if she was very critical, if she was very intense. Um, chances are that that was the case or the mother figure, whoever was there, um, fulfilling that role. And uh, it's square in the notes. All of that is square in the notes in the first and seven. So this axis right here, first and seven, um, it's usually that paradox that we have between self and other. Um, do I go it alone? Do I engage? And when I engage, I kind of want to go it alone. And when I'm alone, I kind of want to be with somebody. And it's kind of that, mm, not so sure which one cannot quite integrate that balance sort of thing. And which one, let me see, the resolution node here would be, I always have a hard time with this. It's gonna be that's North node, if I'm not mistaken. And if I am, please let me know. So it's going to be, this is a similar chart to mine actually. Um, different nodal position, but uh, so your north node is going to be the, the resolution node. It's really being open and diverse about the types of relationships you engage in and, and how to define relationship. Um, and not confine yourself to a restrictive view of them, what they're supposed to look like. Um, and I'm talking here. Um, gender, I'm talking um, whether uh, polyamory is an option, whether, you know, diversity. Gemini is really curious, really exploring. And then you have Mercury and the second house in Aquarius, a radical kind of um, way of thinking about this is necessary. Uh, it is through that evolution update of your self-worth in ways that are unique and new that you can access that, that you're going to actualize that north node of being able to maintain relationships that don't feel confining and that um, allow that stimulation that you need in relationship. Now with the moon, since we were talking about the moon, how, do you, how does that resonate for you, what I said about your moon? And how, how do you experience your moon? Uh, what what you said about my mother? Here, let me put my video on. I 
Um, what you said about my mother is pretty spot on. Um, very um, absent there, but absent. Mm -hmm. Physically there, but absent. And um, uh, very subtly, uh, I feel she's very Plutonian. Lots of sort of subtle, indirect manipulations. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as what you're saying about the, the North Node in Gemini, I, I that's very much my life, just all kinds of crazy people in my life. I love unusual people. Mm -hmm. I love people who are outside of the box and doing all bizarre things. And, um, and then the Virgo, the, I'm sorry, the, um, the Aquarian stuff is, is pretty spot on too. So, so far it's all, you've been really spot on. It's been great, thank you. Any questions about your moon and how to work with it so you can? Well, that is, a, yeah, how to work with it. <laughs> That's a good do you, question. Do you, uh, I mean, being in Virgo, I mean, my experience of Virgo moons, it can be pretty self-critical and pretty self um, pain inflicting. Uh, do you experience that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's been, <laughs> okay. I, I, for me, it's like, a demand to um, master self-empathy at a degree that I think most people probably don't do. You know, it's, it's like a constant um, dialogue with myself. It, it wasn't always this way, but I finally kind of got a clue um, that I really needed to be almost proactive um, and to really try to focus on uh, very clearly on the needs that are weren't being met yeah and, and trying to you know like we're, instead of living life like oh whatever's coming along I'll just do that you know it was had to be more strategic and sit down and think no wait a minute what what do I really need what does this really need yeah uh, and and even like part of it is is you know sort of um, really learning how to not try to get what I need through people who can't give it to provide that what I need <laughs> you know like my mother <laughs> like your mother yeah yeah and what is it that you need um wow that's a really good question I don't know what my moon needs uh that's it needs a lot of like it needs a lot of transformation it's right next to Pluto and Uranus so it's it's combined itself with the two more potent like catalysts for for transformation right there so it, it wants to and it's almost in a, it's opposing chiron kind of a wide or no it's not a wide orb actually it's pretty it's pretty much on um it wants to exp my sense when you say that it's like i don't want to even put what it want what it needs because i don't want to say it because it is so unknown mm. it, Feels like whatever is coming is going to surprise me and I can feel it because I feel like I'm at the tail end of this massive uh, between um, um, Pluto and right now the transits of Pluto and Neptune it's just been really intense for me and so um, I feel like I'm on the tail end of it because Neptune's going to station direct on my Pluto polarity point soon and and across my chiron again so i don't know it feels like i'm okay now like whoa i cleared out so much stuff <laughs> and, and i i feel almost like i'm gonna skydive or something and i don't know what's coming <laughs> it's really intense yeah. actually <laughs> well that's that's awesome that's nice well then you were then you were doing it yeah, yeah. I, so you say, what is my moon need? I, I really don't know, because I feel like it's, it doesn't know. It's just like stepping out into nothing. Wow. Well, that's, that's I, a good way to put it. Past life stuff. So it, you, when you yeah. said it might be this life, there was a, like five past lives that I had to, to address. So mm, That was beautiful. Yeah. And I, I used the psychedelics to do that, actually. They were yeah. uh, very effective and, and of course with that combination of pluto saturn moon mars in the ninth house you you'd be attracted to that 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something very intense, Plutonic, and, and it's yep. opposing Chiron in Pisces. So it's the expansion of the mind through the mystical experience and going through the wound, um, through the mystical, through the expansion of consciousness. And um, yeah, again, Chiron and Moon, like in the other chart. Yeah. It's really evolving the self image and uh, getting that frog out of that coconut shell. Using all those forces around you of Pluto, of Uranus, and Mars, and expanding through that wound and cracking open. Yeah. So I just want to say, so this feels very validating. Like I really can in hear what you're saying that, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I need to do. And I like hearing that. Nice. Well, good. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm Francisco. I'm here. Hey, how are you? I'm okay. Are you? I'm good too. Good. So, Cancer Moon, that's my, that's my moon too. Good. Yeah. Do you have any questions, anything you want to share, or do you want me to kind of share what I, what I get ahead for? Actually, many things came to my attention when, during your presentation, when you were speaking about lineage, mm -hmm. My paternal grandfather had moon in cancer, conjunct my moon. Hmm. And I happened to be, well, he was a self-employed engineer. And I happened to be his only descendant who is a self-employed engineer. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> really keep him with that lineage, huh? Right. Uh, yeah. He passed away when I was a, a little child, but still, uh, I had a very good connection with him mm -hmm. and then uh, my youngest son he has moon in cancer conjunct my moon oh wow <laughs> and... so the lineage goes on right oh wow yeah and moon is very interesting to in shamanic astrology is like where we come from it's um kind of like in the moon in cancer for you it's a very even though you're now saying that it's going through the um paternal line this is a very matriarchal line that you come from um, in the past. Uh, so it may have been that um, it is passed through the pit, through the, through the males, but the, the women um, were the stronger figures or in a way, even, even on the shadows, they may have been. But moon in cancer usually has to do with a very strong um, matrilineal line, like matriarchs, like, um, you know, the, yeah, I have that moon too. And even though it doesn't seem that way in my family, um, once I explore further doing some gen uh, soul generational work, I found out how much that was so. Um, so the moon in Cancer, very sensitive moon with, uh, they're in the 12th house. And very, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is, this is a moon that is connected to the cosmic mother. This is in the 12th house. So, I mean, my experience in moon in cancer, it's just, it feels everything before it even thinks about it or, and sometimes it doesn't even know what it's feeling. It just kind of feels for it. Um, and that can really change the way that your mood feels from moment to moment. So, and in the 12th house, there can be a kind of loss of boundaries as far as what emotions are mine, what are not mine. So it can be kind of spongy there. Very much. Yeah, where, yeah, where you can almost, uh, where is the busy? And then you have Neptune in the fourth. And the ruler, I'm seeing Neptune is in the fourth. Again, in the, that's a double signature. Uh, pointing to that kind of very Neptunian, what was your home life? Uh, early childhood. <laughs> well, as you mentioned, my mother, my mother is a matriarch. But she's a covert narcissist, really. Uh, she li likes to play the victim. 
She's very Neptunian, I would say, uh, very evasive. She never admits anything. Mm. But also, she has life in the fourth house. Uh, well, mm, Neptune in the fourth. Uh, my father was also an alcoholic. Yeah. A very Neptunian man. I mean, he loved singing, played domino, uh, yeah. and drink. <laughs> yeah, and the cusp of that house is, is, is in Scorpio. So that intensity, that, that um, the, the shock or the emotional um, sense of betrayal, whatever that costs to you, um, that's indicated there by, uh, by Scorpio being on the cusp. And then you have the South Node as well. And um, so your Moon is aspecting, before I go to the South Node, again, we have, no, it's not actually square in Chiron. No, it's recording it by sign, but not. But it's very close to Sirius. And that is the mother. That is the, um, I will, you were just describing that. And it's Sirius in Cancer in the 12th house. Um, it's, it's in conjunct your, your south, your north node and Mars in the six. You were just talking about your mother being narcissistic and in and, and ways that maybe she was given, but then she wasn't, or she was used and that's manipulated manipulate you um yeah so uh any questions about how to work with this moon Francisco, are you there? I, I, I lost you for a while. I'm, I'm, oh. my, my internet connection is, is, is really bad. So I'm trying to shift where, to that. Where did you, what was the last, thought, last thing you heard? Oh, you were speaking about the sense of betrayal in the, uh, uh, given by the, the, um, the cost of my fourth house in Scorpio, which is, explains a lot, honestly, but then the rest. Oh, the rest too. Okay. I most, lost most. You lost that. most of it. So I was talking about Ceres, uh, the asteroid Ceres being really close to your moon. It's not okay. conjunct, but it's close enough. And that, um, that is also, that represents mother, the, the nurturing aspect. And uh, it's also there in Cancer in the 12th house. It's in conjuncting your North Node and Mars in the sex. So there may have been there a mother that it may have seemed very given, but at the same time used that against you and um, tried to manipulate you or made you feel guilty. Um, yeah, so there was a sense of you wanting to feel special and um, maybe not always finding that. So inner child wounding for sure with all that Leo and all that um, and the moon and cancer. That needs, to be, that needs to be healed. Um, dear Leo, I, I'm also a Leo son with a, with a cancer moon. So that can be, it's interesting that you talked about your mother being narcissistic because what I find, and this is what I find in myself, that with this combination, we can get pretty caught up in our own emotions and in our own subjective filter of reality. To the point that almost everything kind of has to do with us even when we don't realize that we're doing it so that's something to watch for i'm not saying that's your case but it is an expression of this combination with that all that leo in the first and then that cancer moon um where the inner child really needs to be special seen validated and now it kind of sort of everything um, revolves around us um, so that Aquarius uh, North Node there is really showing that uh, deconditioning from that, that objectivity that needs to be found, that discernment between what is mine and what is not, what has to do with me and what has not to do with me, has nothing to do with me, and ways to, um, to be in the world, to serve, to, to have a function where you can start separating from that more and more and more. Okay, and bringing that moon 
into a more um, into maturity because that moon in cancer can, can can become quite childish sometimes when it doesn't get what it wants emotionally right. so really holding that within you like instead of going horizontally when you we get these emotions that are going here and here and here and to either get it from someone or from something or to push it away and with that moon there there could be getting it from something you said your father was an alcoholic so it, it could lead to addictions if we don't watch it as a way to cope with that when all those emotions are happening and the and the and i think the the thing to do here is to go vertical with that to really sit with that and hold it and really meditate with that ask that what is it that you need uh, where are you in my body um what color are you what shape are you to have a dialogue and a relationship with that with that moon and that is a very sensitive moon very emotional and it can lead to a lot of like let's numb it out or let's try to get it from others so bring that here i don't know if that resonates with you but that's kind of what i'm getting yes very much and i, I try to do it i do a lot of Taoist yeah. practices so I, I i deal with my emotions every day anger fear mm -hmm. anxiety sadness right and i need a lot of time on my own especially after going to a public place like a government yeah. office or a marketplace i need to go back to under the coconut shell to recharge yeah. <laughs> right because you probably absorbed everything from everybody with all that um porosity that you have so now you kind of have to like yeah really building that boundary uh for this moon is important you know um breaking up out of that coconut shell i don't mean it in the world so we can absorb everything from everybody i mean it more in trans in ways that we can break out of that here in a vertical way to transform but not to absorb everything especially with your moon that is very prone to do that anyways any more questions Okay, Barbara, that brings us close to the end of your meeting. Did you want to share any final thoughts on the moon as the filter of ego? Mm, let me think. I think I rushed through my presentation. It's not my strength. I enjoy the interactions a lot more. Uh, so I hope it made sense. And if it didn't, please ask the questions. Um, mm, thank. No, just that how we, um, it's really important to, to get into a relationship with our moon. Um, when I said it's the first filter, I meant it. It is whenever we ask somebody, ask the questions so who are you? Or we ask ourselves, who am, who am I? The first thing that comes to our minds, whether they, they are emotions or words, that's usually the contents of the moon. Um, our self image, our, our ego structure. Uh, we don't usually go to like the uh, um, unity consciousness. We, we're usually more here in this encapsulated ego. So I think that it is very important to get to know that so we can begin to expand and begin to evolve and to really work with that ego and heal it, give it what it needs, get to really know it, get, it, get into a relationship with it. Very, very intimate. And I think that is a key way to separate from mother as we mother ourselves and achieve that maturity and mother and father ourselves. And then from there, in my observations from all the inner journeys, once we clear those bushes, uh, we start expanding into the, the transpersonal, the, the cosmic, the, all of the rest of who we are. And, and like I said, it's not a linear trajectory, like from A to B, it sometimes happens 
here and there, a bit of this, a bit of that, but it seems to be quite important to clear those bushes first to really expand and evolve. And uh, working through the perinatal um, matrix uh, is very, very important because we, they're very imprinted within us and we don't usually have a ways to talk about it because we weren't talking when it happened, we were being born. Um, and that's pretty much within the moon uh, encapsulation. And those working through that can be extremely powerful in, in acquiring self-knowledge, self-empowerment, and really wholeness. So yeah, that is, I think, those are my last words. <laughs> Great, Barbara, thank you so much. I found your meeting very helpful indeed. I also have the moon in Cancer, and um, I also really enjoyed your interaction with the volunteers. So thank you very much, Barbara, and the volunteers. We'll catch you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, Linda. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.